Okay, let's get going. Um, good morning. So we're gonna cut. What we're gonna cover today is the Tech Method. The Tech Method was a book that was written by um, Gary R. Lloyd back in '88. Um, um, when I started in the trade, a service manager kind of turned me on to it. Um, it's just kind of what it really is, is a disciplined way to troubleshoot a piece of equipment, you know, with refrigerate, a refrigeration piece of equipment with refrigeration systems, you're always dealing with the four basic components, the metering device, the compressor, the evaporator and the condenser. And so what this is, is it's kind of a technique to kind of keep you disciplined in your thought processes. So no matter if you're working on an ice machine, a self-contained, a remote, a rack, um, you're always going through your step processes and. And so what it's done for a lot of guys, including myself over time, is it, it starts the, uh, it, it, as, as you are disciplined, you're able to troubleshoot a lot quicker, more quickly and efficiently. And not only that, you're more effective in your, in your diagnostic because you do continue to go through all of the checks and you start to allow yourself to dig through the process of finding what the real issue is instead of just addressing the symptoms when you're dealing with refrigeration systems. So. We're just going to run through the T and the E today, um, and then we'll we'll touch on the C and the H next week. And so, if you guys have any questions, speak up. But that's what we're going to be touching on today. So, so real quick, um, tech tech is an acronym in this case: temperature evaporator, compressor, and condensing unit, and and heat load and heat transfer is what the TECH stands for. So. We're going to touch on the T, the temperature. So temperature in the tech method, what is the current temperature of the case? What is the current temperature of the space? If it's an HVAC unit, what is the current temperature of the, the water on the ice machine? You know, when you guys go in and you troubleshoot an ice machine, the first two things that you should be checking is your inlet water temp and your ambient temp. So, and then you should keep drop a, a K thermometer in the water temp and, and make sure that you're cooling at a, at a certain rate. And depending on the manufacturer, it'll tell you what that's supposed to be about five minutes into the freeze cycle. And so no matter what, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to look at the temp. The temp's going to tell you a lot. So uh, in this case, in, is the case thermometer working? It's going to be thermostat. It's going to, you know, thermometer will tell you if it's reading correctly. Thermostats are going to tell you if it's, uh, you know, is the control mechanism there? So how are we going to verify it? You know, an easy check is to, you know, take your case, case uh, style thermometer out, your Fluke 52 or whatever meter you're using. If you guys are using a field piece or another multimeter, take your, your K, verify the temp, and then turn that, uh, turn that A19 dial down or up. So you can also do it with cold controls. You can usually hear them click. Um, so it's just a quick check. Just make sure you mark where it was before you start messing with it so you know where to return it back to. Uh, how, do the co how do your uh, refrigeration lines feel? What does the suction feel like? What does a liquid line or, or drain leg feel like? So <clears throat> guys, it, when you're out on calls, especially when you're starting into the trade, always do always fill the lines. Like fill them when they're, it's working good. Fill it when it's not working good. You know, I know that this is true. When you when you grab those lines, your brain logs that da that data. So and so, I can't tell you how many times I've been on a job and I've had I've had all my meters hooked up, and I've done a couple repairs, and I feel the lines went up before, and I feel the lines after. And because I've done that so often, even though I want to call it good, I have this uneasy feeling in my in my spidey senses, and so. I, uh, I'll drive away from the job and sure enough, a couple days later, I'm back out there and I miss something. And so the good thing is, is like, fill the lines when it's not working, fill the lines when it is working. Every single time that you, you do a job, you know, use your senses, your touch, your smell, your, your, your sight, your hearing. Um, that's the best tools we have. So how did the return bend fill on the condenser? So <clears throat> if you are at the sea, if you're in the C part of the tech method and you're trying to fill the, the condenser will tell us how we're condensing, depending on how you, the touch, the two thirds, one third rule, two thirds hot, one third, you know, a little bit warmer than ambient. That tells you that the, the, uh, the refrigerant's condensing to a liquid. So, and then, and you're getting good condensing. If you have any abnormal patterns through your condenser, that's one, 
that's one easy check that you can do. It's not, nothing is uh, foolproof anymore with all the different types of modulating systems and stuff we have. But if you're dealing with a traditional remote or, or self-contained system and you have that, all you have is a liquid line solenoid in place and you don't have a lot of modulating valves, you can do that two thirds, one third check depending on the charge and it will tell you if it's condensing. So, and how, how should these lines feel good in running conditions? Um, if you guys have ever heard the term beer can cold, that's an old tech term that they use about for walking coolers. So if you feel that line in spear can cold, you know, it's working good. So I always, it always cracks me up when I'm dealing with a, an old school guy. So, cause it's, it's kind of true. Um, you know, if you can put, you put your hand on it, guys know what that temperature should be when it's satisfactory. So, you know, just grab the, again, you just grab the lines. The only, the only line I suggest you don't grab is the discharge, obviously, because it's going to burn you at certain times of the year pretty quick. So I do the two finger touch on the discharge line. The reason why I do that, especially like this time of year, is if you have a flood back issue, your, your discharge line will be abnormally cool. So we had a situation yesterday at a, at a supermarket where we were dealing with this problem. It was flooding back to the rack. I was talking to a tech on the line. I told him to grab, I, I first told him to two finger touch the discharge line. He said it wasn't that warm. I told him to grab it with his hand. He said, it's pretty cool. We figured out that uh, going across our mechanical subcooler, it was, it was flooding back. So. So if it's flooding back, you're not going to get a whole lot of heat pickup, or you're going to have pretty uh, subcooled liquid coming back, um, and it's going to be flooding the compressor. You're not going to get a lot of heat off your discharge line. So again, just use your hands, use your ears. If you hear, if you walk into a walk-in cooler, and you hear um, a loud hissing, if you walk by a case in a market and you hear a loud hissing, and you can hear that valve starving, that's going to tell you something. If you can walk into a cooler and you can smell the food, that's going to tell you something. So. As you guys get more and more familiar with the trade, you know, your senses will tell you, you know, your di initial problems before you ever pull out a meter or a tool. Temperature controls, <clears throat> thermostats, low pressure controls, evaporator pressure regulators, solid state thermostats and control modules. Uh, energy management systems or EMS controllers. Um, and defrost time clocks. Defrost time clocks is really not a temperature control. I, I know it's on here, but it's more of a defrost control. So it doesn't do anything with the temperature except shut the solenoid down or shut the compressor off in an off cycle system to make sure that you have adequate time to defrost the coil. So we're going to touch on, you know, all of these things today. So thermostats, the most common thermostats we see are the A19s. So in, in the larger systems and, and they use the Renko A12701. That's a pretty typical cooler cold control. But when you're dealing with cold controls, honestly, you need to understand your application. You need to understand your cut-in and cut-out. Some of them have adjustable cut-ins or cut-outs. Um, so when you guys are using a non-OEM part and you're going to your local parts house to get a, a self-contained up and running, you need to make sure that you're looking at what the cut in and cut in first Google or get on the phone with tech support and find out what the manufacturer spec is for your cut in cut out. And then, you know, adequately go find that um, control that's within that range. If it's adjustable or non-adjustable, cause you can buy either and then uh, make sure that you're dealing with either an air over or direct contact pigtail. So you can, the difference is this one is the pigtail on the end of, of, of the cap tube and you can get a pig tool pigtail tool that will do that for you and that's an air over so or you have the direct contact where you shove it in the well and inside the coil and that is going to be where you keep the cap tube straight and then you fish it into the well so understand what application you have for that understand what you need to do with that that cold control is there any questions on that okay what are common characteristics of a mechanical thermostat? Uh, the pressurized capillary tube or bulb, a diaphragm, uh, and two uh, or three electrical connection points. So when you guys are dealing with an A19 and you have three, you'll have three terminals on those A19s, either an ABC24C or a BBC2C, um, the remote or coiled, uh, you're gonna wanna make sure that you're hitting the red and the yellow terminal. So 
if you're dealing with a cooler. So, and I think it's the top and the bottom um, of uh, terminals. So, but it's the one that's marked with a red dot and the one that's marked with a yellow dot. We've had a, a couple situations where the guys land on the blue dot. So, and that's not, that's not, that's going to actually, uh, it's going to uh, open on rise instead of close on rise. So, uh, a differential or, or a range in the thermostat between, uh, sorry, hold on a second. Cut in and cut out settings is, is that you, if you guys have worked on an A19, you'll see that slider bar on the right hand side. So on the differential, um, that what that slider bar does is it, it, uh, make, turns it from a three degree differential to a 12 degree differential. So you always want it on the minimum setting. Very rarely do you, I see, see people moving off. We want to run that pretty tight. So you want to keep it at that three degree differential. So <clears throat> A1924C is the most common. The, the 24C is the, the remote bulb stat. The, the BBC2C is the coil bulb stat. Remote bulbs are what we mostly use and it's because you know, if you guys want to maximize your air sample for, for the, uh, the thermostat, that remote bulb gives you the, the capability of mounting that thermostat right on the back of the coil or right where you want to, and then locating the bulb where the best sample it would be in the case or in the walk-in. And so we, this is the application we use. When you guys are, when you guys are using uh, a remote bulb, use the, use the um, mounting brackets that it comes with, or I've even seen you know, you can use a zip tie with the screw hole. Um, that's fine as well. Just be careful about, I've seen a couple times where the guys cover half of the, the sample space with a clamp and the clamps insulated. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't matter that much, but if we're trying to be, you know, finite in our, in our calibration, just make sure that we're, we're using what's, what, what they ship up. So they usually sh ship a plastic clip with a hole in it. So when you mount that, just make sure that you mount that securely. So, and then when you guys are wrapping up your, your um, cap tube, just make it look nice. You know, it doesn't hurt to put a, to zip tie it up. It doesn't hurt to put a, look, a clear bead of silicone, clear silicone, not white or gray across that cap tube to kind of keep it, keep it in bay, at bay. Um, I always like silicone cap tubes because if you, if you make it look nice, it also provides um, an insulation to it so that it doesn't rub through on other, on itself or on other components. So. Um, the A19, we use them on big commercial boxes and store cases. If you guys have Mavericks in your areas, we see these a lot on the Maverick walk-ins. So that's where we see these and that's where we install them. You guys should have this, uh, one of these stocked on your truck, at least one. So the thermostat has a common terminal as well as an open on rise and a closed on rise terminal. Uh, make sure that the wire is landed on the proper terminal. So we're going to land it on the common and the closes on rise. So when the temperature rises, it closes, uh, sends power down to the solenoid and turns the, turns the refrigeration on. So the differential can be set from three to 12 degrees. We just talked about this. There's that slider on the right hand side of the control. You have to take the cover off. It's just a little metal tab. It says minimum, maximum. Minimum is three, maximum is 12 degrees. Make sure it's on the minimum setting. So if you're, if you're dealing in a, a walk-in or a, I'm, has anybody ever not had it on a minimum setting? Most of the time I just leave it on the minimum setting. Has anybody messed with the swing for a reason? I'm trying to think of an application where we would widen the differential. Okay. So an A19 coil bulb thermostat. Um, one thing I do want to talk about on this picture, guys, is you notice that there's a knob that comes in the package. If you guys are installing this in a public box or a walk-in cooler where it's accessible, please leave, please don't put the knob on it. So it's, it's customers love to, to mess with the knobs. So I want, I want us to be able to set it and forget it. So if you guys, when you guys are setting these up, pull the tab out, set the temperature and then watch and then, you know, take your sample with your K thermometer, verify that you're cutting and cut out is where you want it to be. So watch it cycle a couple times and then put the tab back over the screw, uh, the flathead adjustment setting, and then walk away. Don't, and throw the knob in the garbage. So like, you know, there's no reason for the knob. I know it's nice because you can put it on there and you can turn it, but 
without fail, if it has a knob, somebody's going to mess with it. Coil bulb thermostats will be used in a walk-in cooler and freezer. We see these a lot on the back side of the coil with the coil bulb. Um, it's a good application. I still personally prefer the remote because, like I said, I, I, I kind of like picking where I take my sample from. So, but these look a lot nicer. They're cleaner. They're easier to install. So, um, as far as I see mount it, and it's, it is what it is. So, the stat will be mounted in the return airstream. Most of them are on the back side of the evaporator coils on your, on your traditional coils. So, all pen stats come with a common terminal along with the cl closes on rise and opens on rise, just like the other one. These are identical. Like I said, it's the yellow and red um, terminals inside on the th with the three terminals. So just make sure you wire it correctly. Differential is between three and 12 degrees. Cooler and freezer cold controls. Where we'll see these are on um, small, like true cases, Continentals, Dale Fields. Um, if you're not dealing with a, a newer solid state type Dixell controller or Johnson control controller, this is what you'll see is the old mechanical cold controls. So cold control mechanical T-stats are used in, like I just said, a lot of uh, reach-ins, smaller, smaller equipment. So cold controls are preset for specific range and differential. Um, Renko air over thermostats. Air over thermostats are recognized by the pigtail at the end of the cap tube. This type of thermostat will be set by the first setting and the, and the lower setting and the differential. So <clears throat> we have a lot of these in our Maverick uh, low profile um, freezer coils for the defrost termination. So just make sure that these are set correctly guys and that the, the coils inside the well, good. I can't tell you how many freezers I've been out on even as of late that we have icing on the, on the ceiling and we have drips forming and stuff. And everybody thinks that that's um, uh, infiltration or we got an air gap somewhere. No, they're propping the door open number one. So we have to address that issue. But the second issue is, is that um, this isn't set correctly. So let's make sure that we're checking the settings on this. We've been setting them around 60 degrees. So, um, to, to cut out, to drop out the defrost heaters. So make sure that you're setting this, but that's where I see the most of this control. And this is the exact one they're using right here. So low pressure controls. Um, there's still a bunch of cases out there that use low pressure controls to run their temperature. So setting low pressure controls properly, you always set the low event first. Once the low event is set, the next you will set the differential. When you're setting low pressure controls, you will need to be gauged up to properly set or correct pressures. Guys, if you're working on self-contains and you're a rack technician, don't hook, don't hook your six-foot hoses up to that piece of equipment. Please buy yourself a set of stubbies. They make a lot of nice Bluetooth sets of stubbies now. You can Testo make some, Sporlin make some. Um, I mean, everybody's got a, got a pair of Bluetooth stubbies. So when you guys are doing calibration and not charging, use a set of stubbies. Don't, don't mess with the charge. So the bit, the best thing to do is, is like when we get into the H and we talk about actually gauging up between the T in tech method and the T E and C, we never touch our gauges. So the only time that we're going to gauge up to a piece of equipment to, to start calibrating or checking things, you know, superheat and subcooling is when we're, a, we're at the H stage, the very final stage of our troubleshooting method. Evaporator pressure regulators, EPRs. So you see two, three styles here. One's an aura, it's an angle valve with an Allen setting. It's that one on the far left. So the other two is uh, one's called, we call it a pi valve is the slang name. It's a PI, it starts it's because the model starts with a PI, it's a Sporlin valve. And that's the one without the solenoid. And then, you know, my personal favorite is the, the Sorit. So, and that's the one with the suction, the solenoid coil on it. And the difference between the two, the top and the bottom one is one has a suction stop, which means it closes the valve completely off during defrost to, to um, you know, hold the pressure back. Once the pressure rises, it closes down the expansion valve and stops it from, because it's the, uh, the coil pressure shuts the expansion valve down and it, and it defrosts the coil. So when you guys are dealing with this type of, these types, just know your application and know um, what, what it's used for. So most, most of what you'll see on the back of supermarket racks is 
the 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 Sora, the top one. Hopefully, that's a great valve. That's a Sporlin valve. So, EPRs are primarily used on parallel rack systems, regulating the evaporator pressure uh, to maintain a constant temperature and minimal temperature swings. So, EPR with a suction stop will have a solenoid coil to stop the flow of vapor during defrost. Temperature may be adjusted with a slight turn of the pilot screw and increase or decrease pressure. So let's talk about the pilot screw adjustment. When you guys are adjusting temps with an EPR, what, what you'll notice is whenever you're turning a case down, it'll immediately react because you're dropping pressure. So what gets guys messed up is when they go to warm a case up. When you warm a case up, you have to wait for the pressure to rise in the evaporator. It has to get warmer. So you got to be patient. Take it slow. Adjust an eighth turn at a time and then watch it for a few minutes. When I say a few minutes, give it five. So turn it, turn it an eighth of a turn, watch it. Turn it an eighth of a turn, watch it. Waiting five minutes seems like an eternity when we're in a hurry, but it's going to be a lot longer if you start getting heavy on that pilot screw. So make sure that you're making finite adjustments. Whenever you're adjusting anything on these refrigeration systems, Small adjustments and weight, small adjustments and weight, whether it be in TXV and EPR, whatever you're doing, just make sure that you're taking your time. So, because if you don't, you're going to, you're either going to think you got it and leave, and then you're going to be back the next day because the customer says it's still not working, or you're going to get too heavy on it and you're going to cause yourself more problems than it's worth. So just take your time. <clears throat> Solid state temp controls. Um, we're seeing a lot of these now. Most of your new stuff coming out is coming with this, this type of controller. Um, Dixel was bought by Emerson. So you, you can see this can be a network controlled or a standalone, meaning we're seeing these in, in these actually will run as the controller for a case, but it'll communicate with a, a EMS controller. Or you can see this as a standalone where it has an orange lead defrost sensor and a green lead temp sensor. So just understand what you're dealing with. Um, this seems to, to stump guys a little bit. Um, most of us have got it down, but there's still a few technicians out there that seem to struggle with the dynamic defrost that they're using out of this. And what dynamic defrost is, instead of putting it on a time defrost, it looks at the temperature of that um, coil temperature. And then as soon as it, it hits a certain set point, it, it actually sends it into a, a shortened defrost. So it's actually looking at that thermistor and that temp only. So make sure you understand what the controller settings are. I know that, you know, we see a lot of them on the structural concepts case and none of them are set up the same way. We see a lot of them on uh, the new Hill Phoenix cases that have been coming out um, into the Mavericks. And again, we haven't found any of them set the same way. So make sure you understand how to program these. If you don't, give me a call. I'll send you over some literature depending on the model. But there's, Dixell makes them, Johnson Controls makes them. Um, I know I'm missing a couple brands, but um, Corel makes them. So that's very common control right now. So, and then EMS building controllers. So, you know, Emerson, Microthermal, Danfoss, Novar. So uh, Opto 22, these are EMS controllers. EMS are, uh, controllers are used in big box stores to monitor and control many systems to maximize energy. Again, guys, go, go to the case, <clears throat> verify that the case is warm or what temperature it's running, and then go to the, um, go to the um, controller and verify what the temperature sensor is telling you. Temp sensors and thermistors are located uh, in causing a 5 volts DC signal to control and log temps. And that's just for CPC. So when you guys are dealing with uh, any output on the board, should be five volts DC out. So when you're testing to make sure your sensors, I got a phone call on this yesterday. Um, if you have five volts DC on the sensors itself, that's good, you're good to go. So output boards, um, <clears throat> output boards and cycle solenoids for temp and defrost. Defrost timers. Defrost timers are wired in series with the thermostat to ensure the system defrost. So 95% of the defrost timers, guys, is going to switch on four. So four is going to go down to the thermostat, thermostat through the thermostat to the solenoid. So, and then three is going to go down to your heaters. 
So one and two and N are going to be your line power into the clock. So that's pretty universal for these types of time clocks. Make sure you understand what style and brand you're dealing with. Um, you guys should be stocking this DTM V40 on your truck just because we have so many out there. Not my favorite time clock. They have a lot of issues getting jamming up on the clock itself. But if you guys, you guys can also carry spare faces. So the boards don't go bad at very often unless you, they got 40 amp relays on them. They seem to be pretty sturdy. The weak spot of this time clock is really that face. That face gets jammed up. It gets, it's all made of plastic. It's cheesy. It, it doesn't, um, it doesn't, it binds up. It gets a little bit of dirt or dust in it and it binds up. So you can actually take the two screws out and look at what the voltage is on the backside of the clock. And I carry a 120 and a 240 clock. You can actually just snap a new a time clock right onto that board. <clears throat> so defrost timers are um, installed on all equipment that runs 37 degrees. I don't like that that point. Defrost timers, you need to use your discretion. Depending on the humidity, depending on the, the region you're in, depending on the temperature um, is where you need to put a defrost time clock. You know, 37 degrees is good for Utah because we're at a 14% humidity most of the time, you know, and so we can run, uh, we can run floral boxes and some produce boxes at 38, 39 degrees and not, and not have, have use for a defrost time clock. But it just depends on where you're at. If you're dealing in a high humidity area, you're, got, you're probably no matter what going to need that. So I don't like that, that, that tab right there. Just use your discretion. If you're dealing with a cooler, put a defrost time clock on it. It's just going to save you a, a, a call for other extenuating circumstances. So, so as we're applying the T, as we're applying this, the temp checks, no matter the equipment, check the temp first. <clears throat> so, and if we're, the temp is going to be whatever you're trying to cool. So if it's an air case, you're going to check the air. You're going to take a sample of the air. If you're dealing with an ice machine, take a sample of the water. Because remember, that's what we're trying to cool, and that's why we're having an issue is because we're not removing the heat out of that air or out of that water, so the refrigeration is not working, and that's why they've called us out. So start with your senses. Touch the lines to see if the lines are proper temp. Run your hand in front of the air screen on, the, on cases. Uh, walk, uh, and then walk in the, the walk-in coolers and freezers. Like Just walk into them. Your body will immediately know if it's good or bad. Cause you'll smell things, you'll feel the temp, you'll, I mean, you guys know when a cooler feels good or if you walk in, you're like, ah, something's wrong. So and then verify with your temperature meter. So what you guys should do on your initial, on your initial, you should have your meter in hand. Um, whatever that you're using for temp. If you're using a 52, I've seen guys use those little pencil thermometers. Um, you know, I don't have a, really have an issue with that. They work somewhat, but they're not as finite as like a 52 K K style thermometer. So the best thing to do is carry a 52 or carry a multimeter with a K style thermometer on there. Um, so the a K style probe, so you can, so you can really test and verify down to the 10th degree, what, what your temperature is running at. So check all your, your temperature controls and make sure that your controls are, are, are functioning properly. So evaporator, when checking evaporator, we should be checking a few items. How does the frost and sweat and ice pattern look? Uh, is the TXV metering device feeding correctly? How does the suction line leaving the evaporator feel? How does the liquid line entering the evaporator feel? And how is the airflow? What is the condition of the case? So <clears throat> let's talk about the frost sweater ice pattern. So when checking the ice and, this should say frost. We're checking the frost and sweat pattern visually. Recognize the difference between a good pattern. If you have an ice pattern, that's immediately bad. So you shouldn't have an ice pattern. So if you have a frost pattern or a sweat pattern, um, that's, that's fine. So if you have ice, you need to f figure out why it's icing. So different cases on the coils and equipment will have different acceptable patterns. Here are a few examples of bad patterns. Take a look at the pictures and, let's, and let us discuss what types of sim the symptoms are. So right here we've got a, a looks like a little self-contained case. This is a block of ice. So this has been icing up for some time. 
So the ice tells a story, guys. If you're dealing with solid ice or, or you got to look at if it's solid ice and it's never and it's all even, then that's probably hasn't gone into a defrost for a few days. So, and it's, it's, you know, based on it's, it's, it's never cycled off and it's, it, was, it probably started out as hoar frost and then it turned to ice. You could have a plug drain line too. Usually when you have a plug drain line or you're not defrosting fully, that ice will be uneven. It'll be, it'll be thin at the top of the run and it'll be thick at the bottom. This is on a traditional coil. Um, you see how that's uneven? You have it all the way up at the top on the one side, and then it kind of you can kind of see the coil on the other side. This is probably from an improper defrost, a heater going out, a plug drain. Could be a couple things there. So, and this this is a even this even hoar frost you see on this a a coil. That's probably from plug filters because um, it's an AC or a slipping belt or it's inadequate airflow, whatever it is, because it's nice and even, and it's just it's frosted up solid. So somebody's probably got a knit sweater on their, on their air filter. Metering devices when examining the evaporator without gauging up to the system. Remember, we, have, we don't gauge up till H, so we're only at E. What are some of the ways to know if a metering device is feeding properly? So a couple things on metering devices, guys. If you, want to see, if you want to understand if the power element's doing its job, you can either grab it with your hand or you can pour hot water on the element itself. Do not use a torch ever to heat this up. So I watched a guy blow, blow up a power head using that method. It's really bad. So it doesn't need a lot of heat. Just grab it with your hand and unbolt, unhook it from the, the two copper clamps on the pipe. Grab it with your hand. Hold it there for, you know, 30 seconds. You should start to hear the valve throttle. If it doesn't do that, then you may have a power head issue. The second check to do is take some hot water and pour it over the valve. So if your valve has non-condensables in it and it's actually iced up the valve, it'll actually unthaw out the valve and it'll actually take off. So it's a couple easy checks you can do. If you've done those two things, sorry about this guys. Can you guys still see that PowerPoint? We see uh, the last one we see is uh, the metering devices when checking expansion valve. How do you check the power head? Okay. I'm just trying to find it. It bumped off my computer for some reason. Hold on a second. Okay. Uh, how do you know when you have a plug cap tube? Um, well, that's pretty easy, guys. If you have, if it's coming off the cap tube and it's frosting heavily at the beginning of the cap tube, and you grab your suction line and it's not cool, it's probably restricted. The best way to know if you're restricting those systems are usually fairly small. If you're dealing with the cap tube, um, unless you're dealing with like an AC cap tube, which I don't see a lot of anymore. But if you're dealing with a cap tube, like multiple cap tubes, like a metering, uh, uh, metering manifold or something. That's different, but if we're talking about just a self-contained cap tube system, you usually have you can usually tell by the frost pattern at the very beginning of the the dry where it comes out of the dryer and expands. Um, it's usually heavily frosted there, but also because you're you're uh, restricting, usually your uh, liquid lines abnormally warm because you're holding back all that refrigerant. Um, depending on the time, uh, it's usually on a self-contained. So um, that's how you know if you have a restricted cap tube. When you guys have cap tube systems please make sure that you don't just change the dryer and then file back the cap tube, you know, a couple inches and think you got it. So I talked to a lot of guys. I'll look at a lot of tickets too, where we, it's a cap tube system and the guys have been out on it multiple times because they changed the dryer and they changed the refrigerant and kept restricting. 
Um, when you guys have a plug cap tube, change the whole cap tube. So if you have a cap tube um, diameter tool, make sure you check the, check the diameter of the cap tube, pick up some new cap tube. You got to measure out the length of the cap tube. So, and then replace the whole cap tube. And when you guys are, obviously when you guys are uh, replacing cap tubes, it's always good just to file one side and then, and then bend it back so that you get a nice clean break and a nice unrestricted orifice on that cap tube. <clears throat> Any questions on that? Any of those? So what are some of the other signs of a metering device not working? Um, so not necessarily the metering device not working, but if you guys have checked, um, if you guys have done the hot water test on a couple of the, on the valve and on the, on the power head, um, and it's still having problems, that's, it's time to pump that down and check that screen. So that pickup screen's probably plugged. Um, the other thing you, you guys can check that's a bigger problem, if you guys are having a lot of expansion valves in like a market application, check your oil. So oil flows with the refrigerant. Um, if you've lost the viscosity or the oil looks terrible and nobody's changed it um, and, your, and your valves keep sticking, it's because your oil's bad. <laughs> So we've had it on a couple of stores that we've taken over where the oil has never been changed. We've got a company out in our area that doesn't believe in changing oil. And so a couple of the stores we've taken over, they've had multiple, they've changed a lot of valves. They've done a lot of things. And we come to find out that the oil is just in really bad shape. So we change out the oil in the racks, get it back up and running. And what do you know, metering devices do better. All of the valves in the, in the system do better because that is why oil flows with the refrigerant is to lubricate the mechanical valves. So if you guys are having those issues, those are a couple of other reasons why you would be having issues with a metering device. So <clears throat> when examining evaporator frost pattern, the pattern should be even throughout the coil. The frost should be light and minimal, allowing air to pass through the coil, meaning if, the, if it's getting really thick, um, you're dealing with a potential ice up issue and it's not running efficiently. So on ice machines, the ice pattern should be even as it forms on the evaporator plate. So walk-in coolers and freezers, visually inspect the OEM provider thermometer, check and verify temperature with your multimeter, visually inspect coils for cleanliness and frost pattern, visually inspect motors to see if they are running and clean, and check the discharge air temp. So as you guys are checking, again, we're on the EU, so we're just at the evaporators, we're just checking, we're there at the case, we're checking the air temps, and then now we're checking the, the conditions of the evaporators. Like, is it clean? Are the motors running? We deal with a lot of uh, uh, multi-speed motors that we can actually plug in a, a tool to the back of them on a lot of these uh, heat craft cases and heel Phoenix cases and actually adjust the RPMs of the motors. So that's become a, a, an issue. So make sure that your motors are running the correct speed. Make sure that your, um, your, your coils are clear. Make sure that your air screens are clear. So um, just go through your cases really good in the evaporator section. Check your evaporator and all of the conditions around the evaporator. Blower, if you're dealing with an AC, check the blower mode, motor, check the belt, check the, check the filters. <clears throat> Reaching coolers and freezers, check the, uh, the case OEM thermometer. Just when you guys, when I say check the thermometer, take yours and verify that the thermometer is reading the correct thing. Why, why does that matter? Because who's calling in the call? The customer is. Does a customer have a, uh, a Fluke 52 on them? No, they're looking at whatever that thermometer is telling them. So, and so to, to avoid the nuisance call, calibrate the thermometer, verify that it, you're at least somewhere in the ballpark. So check cleanliness of honeycomb and case, check airflow, pull section of case and visually inspect coil for cleanliness and frost pattern. If coils are iced up, inspect defrost operations and condensate drains. Ice machines, check your ice pattern, perform a production test on flakers and nugget machines. <clears throat> if you guys know how to do a nugget or how to know how to do a production test, pretty much you're just weighing in the ice. So, and then you're taking the calculation in a 24 hour period. So what, what uh, the tech support is going to ask you is a couple things, water temp, water inlet temp. So when you, what that means is when you guys, if you're on a Hoshizaki and it's filling and it hasn't gone into a freeze, so there's no mechanical refrigeration in play at that point. You're just testing the water coming from the city, so or coming from the, the supply. 
you're going to drop your case style thermometer in the sump and you're going to test that water. We got an issue around the company right now. If that water temp is coming in at lower than 57 degrees, you need to put a mixing bowl on that ice machine. So we need to mix some hot water with some cold water and get that closer to like 65 or better between 65 and 70. Because what we're running into is Hoshizaki's run water in between the plates during the harvest. And if the water's too cold, there's not enough heat in the water to transfer that heat to the plates to drop the ice. So the, the water, the, the supply water coming into the machine assists the harvest. So if you guys are having a harvesting issue, you keep going up on an ice machine and you've gone through the charge and you've gone through everything and you cannot for the life of you figure out why you keep icing up, check your water supply temp. If you're even close to 57, it's probably getting colder than that at night. Make sure, let's get a mixing valve on that machine. And that's from our Northern regions. That's Denver, Idaho, Utah, Wyoming, um, we're seeing a lot of that, even up in some of the Arizona stores and Flag and uh, Snowflake and, and that stuff. So we want to make sure if you're dealing with a, a Hoshizaki, make sure that your water temp is, is you know, sufficient for the harvest. <clears throat> okay. Um, when you're doing a production test, so if I drop 50 pounds in 30 minutes on a Hoshizaki, I'm going to times that by, there's 24 hours in a day, so I get two drops an hour. So I'm going to multiply that by 48 and that's going to be my production for the day. So you might have a 1400 pound machine, but depending on the water and air temp, you might not be getting anywhere near that. So that's why it's good to do a production test because it's, it's really nice to be able to look your customer in the eye and say, based on the conditions of this machine, it's doing everything it can. So shut off water, uh, shut the water off and let evaporator dry to inspect cleanliness and condition of evaporator. Guys, you got to inspect these evaporators dry. You can't see the calcium with them wet. So, and I've actually been schooled by a couple of um, OEMs. They constantly tell me this. The first thing they ask me when I say it was clean is like, well, was it dry? How do you know? And so we want to make sure we dry out that evaporator and then snap a photo of our evaporator to tell, to let a customer know that it's dirty. So verify that the water flow meets the machine requirements. For Hoshizaki's, it's 20 pounds or more. So if you're under 20 PSI on your water pressure, you're going to have issues. So I would just say that as a rule of thumb for every ice machine, just make sure you have 20 pounds or better of inlet water pressure. <clears throat> Air conditioners and, and that's on the fill. So you need to look at that gauge when it's filling. So, cause a lot of times those will drop off. If that drops off the 20 on your gauge, it's, you're, you got a problem with your water filters. So inspect air filters, check dates and initials, note a folder than 90 days. Check blower motor and belt. Guys, we have a lot of guys that um, think that if they have a glazed belt to change the belt, if you have a glazed belt, it's gotten hot. If, you, um, if it's getting hot, you need to check your shiv. So if you're looking at your shivs, you need to check if it's hued, you need to check how the belt's making contact. If it's offset, Something is causing a lot of friction on that belt to gloss that belt. So if you guys end up changing a gloss belt, don't just change the belt. Find out why it's glazing. So because usually a worn out belt is cracking and falling apart, that's okay. That's just going to happen to rubber over time. But if you're glazing um, and you pop that belt off, it's probably going to do it in a couple, a couple days or a couple weeks. It's not going to make it until it's for six months. So you need to find out why it's doing it. Uh, and check, check evaporator for sweat and frost patterns and cleanliness. So this is going to be a big deal in the next two months for us getting ready for summer. Inspect condensate drain pans for cleanliness and proper draining. Um, <clears throat> I can tell you without fell, I can, I can walk on a rooftop, I can pop PVC drain line and I can knock it on the ground and I can get dirt clods out of it. So when you guys are out doing your checks and your inspections and your spring startups for the next few months, pull the drain line, clean it out. So the other thing too is, let's take that uh, outdoor aluminum filter, pull it off the economizer, take it downstairs on the concrete, wash it with some new bright, and then rinse it really good. That new bright gets those things spotless and then throw it back in if it's aluminum and then throw it back in the economizer. That economizer filter is probably the number one most missed thing on an AC maintenance. So that and the, and the condensate drain. So let's make sure we're doing those checks when we're out. Whether we're doing service on it or we're doing PM on it, let's make sure we're checking those two things. So <clears throat> cold wall uh, cases and chill rails, 
visually inspect the frost pattern around this. This is for the condiment coolers that we deal with. So check the defrost components. Check convection fans. So Kyrak, and I, I know there's a couple other brands out there, they use a, a, an actual fan in the bottom of the pan. So below that actual fan is a drain. So when you guys are doing inspection or you're doing, you're working on a chill rail, no matter what, if you're there to just make a temp adjustment or check a couple things, please, please, please pull that fan and check that drain. We lose more of those fans because those drains back up with food or debris than, than we should. So let's make sure that we pull those, those fans, check, check that drain, make sure that there's nothing that's going to restrict it, and then put the fan back and, and make sure that the fan's clear of any restriction and that it's clean. So, and then just, again, ch check those condensate drains. So that's the number one issue that we run in with those convection style cold rails. So inspect all evaporators. So on the wrap up, inspect all evaporators for proper feeding patterns and cleanliness. Inspect all fan motors, blower motors for proper operation. Inspect and verify all defrost components, heater clicks on switches, defrost termination and time clocks. So, um, Defrost termination, do not, do not, do not take defrost termination out of the circuit. Don't do it. I've caught a couple guys doing it. They say, well, I don't understand why you need it. We need it. It prevents an ice up. It prevents, it gives time for, for um, the defrost termination, and it's usually a fan initiation too. So that clicks on. That's why there's three leads on that clicks on. You need to make sure that that's in play because we need to have some drip time on that coil to get the water down the drain. So do not take it out of the circuit. Inspect, inspect all condensate drain lines for proper draining and cleanliness. Make sure all belts and filters are good. Any questions, guys? Concerns? Okay, that's all I got. Stay dry out there and, and be careful in the snow for you northern region guys. Have a good day. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, this is Dietrich with uh, down in Vegas. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Hey, I, I need to, if you could, send me some information on these new Emerson's condensing units that they use now for walk-in coolers, the uh, condensing part. Um, I went out on one last night at uh, one location. I got to get more familiarized with the uh, the those Dixel controllers and stuff like that that's on the inside of them. Okay, yeah, so now, Send me the model you've uh, got, and I'll, I'll get you the I'll get you the right PDF file for that. Okay. All righty. All right. Thanks. And I have one more thing. You okay. said that on the expansion valve to see if it's throttling. You said uh, hold the. Uh, is it? Uh, you said put the bulb in hot water. Yeah, you can do it, or you can hold it with your hand. One or the other. You just need to warm up that bulb to see if the the power head is working. So, cause sometimes you can just change the element and get the valve. That might be the part that failed on the valve. So it's just a quick check to check if it's the power element. The other thing too, is if there's non condensables in the system, it'll, it'll make the valve stick because it gets really cold and it turns to ice. So you can pour hot water on the valve to thaw it out and then it'll take off. If you have that, you know, then you need to address those, those, the reasons for that. That could be a filter dryer change. That could be, you know, you need to check, you know, why you have non condensables in the system, but, those are a couple quick checks you can do on a valve to verify if an expansion valve is working or not working. Okay. All right. Okay, so you said email, email you. Yeah. Email me the model with the one you've got and I'll make sure I get you the right literature for that one. The one that you're working with. Okay. I'm going to ask this crazy question real quick. I want to make sure I have your name correctly. It's J Alexander at core refrigeration.com. J Alexander. Thank you, sir. All righty. Have a good day, guys. You too.